hello everybody thank you very much for your attendance and welcome to this webinar uh, my name is diana croniale i'm the educational manager of bts company uh, today there are a lot of people who are attending this uh, meeting and so for us it's a very great pleasure uh, during this presentation, I'm speaking about BTS clinical functional protocols and uh, how to perform a functional evaluation of the patient thanks to the BTS uh, wearable sensor. So I think that uh, we are ready and so we can start. The first meeting uh, between the clinician and the patient is an essential moment because the clinician is asked to decide uh, what kind of techniques have to be used for the treatment of the patient. The clinician takes advantage of different tools to start his clinical decision on the patient. The conversation with the patient is very important to start and collect all the information uh, necessary to define the medical history of the patient. But even more important is the objective physical exam of the motor behavior, which includes uh, a global functional assessment of the patient. Here we can see two possible different approaches to evaluate the movement. We can study the kinematics of the movement that means uh, the evaluation of the spatial and temporal parameters and the variation of the joint angles during the movement. And we can also evaluate the EMG data that are related to the muscle activity and allow understanding how the muscles are working during the execution of any motor task. Thanks to the functional protocols, we can assess the motor behavior of the patient through the kinematic and EMG approach. About the kinematics, the technology that can support the kinematic analysis of the patient is the BTSG sensor that allows a rapid and objective evaluation of the spatial and temporal parameters and joint angles. Based on which is the specific motor task to be studied, the G-sensor can be placed on any body segment, for example, on the head for the analysis of the cervical spine mobility, on the trunk for all the trunk movements, on the homerus for the shoulder movement analysis, or on the pelvis for walking, running, jumping, and so on. As I just said, the G sensor provides the acceleration and velocity values of the specific motor task perf performed. And at the same time, uh, it allows the evaluation of the joint angles within the movement cycle. The technology that can support the analysis of muscle activity is BTS 3MG that allows a dynamic and non-invasive functional evaluation of the activation of the muscle chains, providing information about the timing, the duration, and the amplitude of muscle activation during the movement. The EMG props can be placed on all the surface muscles uh, based on what, uh, what is the motor task analyzed. And through the recording of the myoelectric signal, it's possible to define the onset and the offset of the muscles in order to verify the correct movement coordination because uh, it's mandatory that one muscle is activating within the movement cycle exactly when it must be active. And then it's possible to evaluate also the amplitude of activation 
in order to establish which is the contribution of each muscle for the execution of the movement. The integration of these two technologies uh, has led to the creation of a real solution dedicated to the clinic and sport for an accurate, fast and effective evaluation of the patient based on the functional protocols. Here we find an example of functional protocols. On the first line, there are the protocols mainly dedicated to the clinical work. On the second line, there are that ones dedicated to the sport field. We have the walking protocol, the flex relaxation protocol for the analysis of the lumbar spine for the prevention of the low back pain. We have the cervical spine mobility protocol for the evaluation of the cervical spine section, the shoulder mobility protocol for the analysis of the shoulder joint. Then we have also the static postural protocol for the postural evaluation. And for the sport field, we have the running protocol, the cycling protocol, the drop fall protocol for the prevention of the anterior cruciate ligament injury. And lastly, we have also the dental occlusion protocol for the evaluation of the neuromuscular balance of the temporal mandibular joint muscles to test the use of the bite. All these functional protocols included in to the software package offered by BTS analysis system uh, allowed to perform the evaluation of the patient starting from a single district up to a complete global assessment of all different body segments so that the clinician can formulate his own functional diagnosis. That is uh, the identification of the main movement disorders, the residual potentialities, and any compensation strategy. All these objective and quantitative data together allow the clinician to set the most effective personalized therapy for the patient. And in the post-treatment, highlight the benefit of the performed therapy. Now I would like to give a synthetic description of the contents of the clinical protocols so that you can understand what type of information you find in the report in terms of parameters, indexes, and graphs. Let's start with the walk protocol. So thanks to the work protocol, it's possible to verify if the muscle activity, mainly of the lower limb muscles, um, follows the physiological behavior. And therefore, it's possible to understand if the patient has a good coordination and symmetry of the movement. Or if due to neurological or orthopedic disorders, the walking is compromised and altered in some of its phases. Okay. Thanks to this video realized for, for you, we would like to show how to prepare the patient. So based on which is the clinical goal in the walking analysis, we go to place the electrodes with the EMG probes exactly on the muscles that we need to evaluate. In this video, it's an example video, okay? Uh, we show how to place the electrodes on the tibialis anterior on both sides, right and left, and then we go to place other two props on the back on the medial gastrocnemius muscles. Okay, as you can see during the preparation, it's very important to place in a correct way the electrodes on the, on the skin in the precise point on the 
on the muscle, but in uh, by the literature we we find we have uh, different guidelines that suggest us how to uh, define and how to discover the correct position of the props. Okay. It's very important that uh, it's uh, only one person uh, who is preparing uh, the, the patient. And then uh, it's possible to ask the patient to perform uh, some um, voluntary movement in order to highlight okay, the belly of uh, the, the muscles where we have to place exactly in the middle the electrodes. Okay. When we finish to place the electrodes, it's necessary to uh, place also the G sensor. In this case, for the walking test, exactly like for uh, running, for uh, drop fall, for many other uh, uh, protocols, okay? It's necessary to place the G sensor on the back on the pelvis, okay, and so in respect with the venous dimples, we have to place the uh, G sensor a little bit under this line in order to be very solidate with the uh, with the pelvis, because during the movement, this is uh, the the walking test, okay, we uh, the G sensor has not to capture the movement of also the lumbar spine. So we have to avoid this interference coming from the spine. We need to assess only the pelvic movement. Okay. The protocols returns uh, uh, a, a, a report where we find uh, different uh, information. Okay, so this is uh, an example of the report. Okay, in the first page, uh, we find symmetry and the quality indexes related to the gait cycle. We have here the main temporal parameters of the gait cycle, such as uh, the duration of the stance phase, the swing phase, the single double support phase, the cadence, the stride time, and all the parameters of the patient are compared to some normal values. Here we have the uh, pelvis movement on the three planes of the body. So we have the sagittal, the frontal and the transversal uh, plane during the execution of right and left gait cycle. So you know very well that the pelvic movement has to be the same while the patient is performing a right cycle or a left cycle. And finally, in the last page, we have the muscle activity with also the co-activation index of agonist and antagonist muscles, where we can assess the patient's coordination. You can see that all the graphs are normalized to the gait cycle. So in a precise moment, of the gait cycle, we can evaluate which is the coordination of the patient in terms of how is, which is the strategy uh, of muscle uh, activation performed by the patient. This gray band allow to remind in which phase exactly of the gait cycle, the muscle must be active. And so it becomes immediate, thanks to this type of representation, to check if the peaks of activation of that specific muscle fall down exactly within the gray bands. OK. Now 
uh, here we have the flexion relaxation protocol. This protocol is used to evaluate the predisposition of people to develop low back pain and prevent its onset thanks to preventive uh, treatments, of course. Okay. In this video, we show how to perform the, uh, the test. It's a very, very simple test because starting from the standing position, the patient is asked to perform an anterior flexion movement of the trunk, keep this position for a few seconds and come back to the standing position through an extension movement. During the maintenance of the flexed position, the lumbar muscles have not to work because from the biomechanical point of view, other muscles are working for the maintenance of this position. And so it's possible to verify immediately if the correct relaxation phenomenon of the lumbar muscles has occurred correctly. Okay, in this other video, we can, uh, we can show uh, how to do what we have to do uh, during the preparation of the patient. Okay, so it's necessary to place the EMG props on the lumbar muscles in this way. So we have to define the higher line, okay, that is the passage between the dorsal to the lumbar tract of the spine then we have to identify also the lower line. Okay, maybe I can move faster the, the video. Okay, if you prefer, you can use a pencil in order to draw this reference on the patient skin. Okay, and so we go to place two electrodes on the left side exactly um, in respect with the, the direction of the muscle fibers, okay? And so we have two probes on the higher part of the lumbar spine and other two probes on the lower part, okay? So maybe we are working with the higher probes around L1, L2 level with the lower uh, props, uh, we are working uh, on L4, L5 level. In this case, uh, our sensor move, uh, movement sensor, the our G sensor has to be placed higher, exactly near the line of uh, the scapula, okay? Because now, Thanks to the G sensor, we can define the flexion extension angle of the trunk. Okay, how to perform the test uh, has been uh, shown uh, just before in the previous video. Okay, now let's look at uh, the, uh, the, 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 the report, okay. Uh, in order to understand how it's possible to assess immediately if the relaxation phenomenon occurred or not occurred. Okay, let's zoom the, the, the report. Okay, let's, uh, um, let's look, for example, this, uh, this graph related to the myoelectric activity of the left spinal erector muscle at L1, L2 level. This horizontal dot line is the energy level of the muscle uh, during the standing position. The first peak represents the contraction of the muscle during the flexion movement. And the second peak, higher than the first one, of course, represents the contraction of the muscle during the extension movement. From this graph, it's immediate to understand that the relaxation phenomenon has correctly occurred. Because during the maintenance phase, that is this central part of the movement, 
um, the energy level of the muscle is lower than the standing energy level. So we can uh, confirm that the uh, relaxation phenomenon has correctly occurred if during the maintenance phase, the uh, energy level of the muscle is lower than the energy level in standing position. So you can immediately understand that from this representation, it's immediate to uh, assess if the phenomenon has occurred or not occurred, okay? In the table, you find also the number, the value in terms of microvolt of the energy. And so you can compare this value during the maintenance phase with the value in standing phase. Now, let's look how the pattern of the curve changes when the relaxation phenomenon doesn't occur. We can see immediately here that the curve remains higher than the standing energy level. Okay. Now, uh, let's move uh, on the next uh, protocol, so the static post protocol. This protocol allows the evaluation of the muscular strategy used by the patient in order to keep a static posture over the time. Okay, uh, surely the most common condition in which to perform the examination is the orthostatic posture. But the use of the protocol can be extended uh, also for the assessment of any other posture in isometric conditions. In this case, um, you can decide to place the electrodes where you want. It's only mandatory that when you select one muscle for the left side, you have to select the same muscle also on the right side. But you can uh, evaluate muscle on the back, on the front on, of the trunk, okay, higher, lower, so on the cervical tract, on the dorsal tract, on the lumbar tract, where you want, of course, based on which is the uh, clinical goal for our patient. In some cases, some of our customers use this protocol also for uh, the evaluation in a static position of the lower limb muscles in order to evaluate which is the strategy in order to keep the standing, the orthostatic position uh, by using the muscles of the lower limbs. Okay. In this case, because we are evaluating the patient in a static condition, we don't need the G sensor because in this case, we don't need to capture any movement. Okay, the protocol provides some indexes that allow as to evaluate if the same muscles of right and left sides of the trunk, both anterior or posterior muscles, as I have just said, are working in a symmetric way in order to maintain that posture. In this case, uh, this is uh, exactly the report related to the child that you have just seen uh, in the video. Because the patient has uh, a scoliotic attitude, there is uh, an important asymmetry between right and left muscles. And we can also evaluate, so this is uh, the global, the total contribution of the left muscles and the disease of the right muscles. But we can evaluate 
uh, in a specific way, which is also the contribution of each muscle. Uh, okay, the shoulder mobility protocol is uh, dedicated to assess the patient capability to perform a flowing and simple flexion, abduction, or rotation movement of the arm in order to point out the presence of muscular disorders related to uh, the shoulder joint. Also in this case, we uh, can select based on which is the movement that we will need to assess. We go to place uh, the electrodes, four electrodes, uh, four props, sorry, on, uh, on the, the muscles, okay, that are involved, uh, of course, in the movement, in that specific movement of the shoulder flexion or abduction or rotation, okay. In this case, for example, uh, uh, this is a, 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 muscles, a muscle, the anterior deltoid, indicated for the uh, assessment of the flexion movement of the shoulder, of course. Okay, so let's uh, move faster the video, okay, because uh, I think that now you have understood uh, how to place the, the electrodes, okay. I repeat that by the literature, we have many different guidelines that uh, provide the correct and specific um, indications in order to be very precise in the position of, of, the, of the electrodes. For example, I don't know if you saw in the video, I uh, touched the C7 vertebra then the acromion of uh, the, the clavicula, okay? And for the, the, the trapezius, for example, the, by the literal two, we know that we have to place exactly at the 50% of this distance, exactly the two electrodes. Um, for the G sensor, in this case, we place uh, uh, it, on the distal part of the omerus with the uh, appropriate uh, belt for this uh, uh, protocol. Okay, and now the child show how to perform a movement of flex extension. Okay. Then by changing maybe the position of uh, only some marker, uh, some uh, electrodes, sorry, uh, maybe from uh, the anterior deltoid, we can move the electrode on the medial deltoid because uh, this muscle is uh, um, more involved in the abduction of the shoulder. Okay, we go to assess also the movement of the shoulder on the other planes. This is the ab abduction. Okay, and finally, we can assess also the rotation. Okay. The protocol uh, returns a report uh, that allows the evaluation of the shoulder kinematics in terms of range of motion. Here we find also some indexes that measure the smoothness of the movement here. Okay, so because it's very important to evaluate the smoothness of the movement performed by the patient. And lastly, we can also evaluate the muscle coordination in terms of activation timing of each muscle within the movement cycle, as well as the percentage of each muscle contribution here during the movement performance. Okay, so this vertical dot line identify 
the change of movement. So when we reach, for example, here, the maximum flexion, and so this is the going phase, and from the dot line up to 100%, it's the returning phase with the extension. And so we can evaluate the shape of the muscle activation, the muscle behavior, in order to evaluate the coordination. Okay, of course, we can do the same for right and left side. Okay, similarly to what we have just seen related to the shoulder mobility protocol, the cervical spine mobility protocol evaluates the patient ability to perform a flex extension, a lateral bending, and a rotation movement, both on the right and left side. Any possible uh, muscle contracture of any or any disorder uh, at the cervical spine level can move into an objective limitation of the spine movement. Here, now I move uh, the, the video faster. Okay, we go to identify the, the muscle of, of the cervical uh, tract. On the front, we can uh, assess the sternocleidomastideo muscle because it's involved both in the lateral bending and also in the rotation movement. And in this case, the G sensor has to be placed on the head, exactly on the protuberance of the occipital bone. And now you can see how the child is performing the movement. Okay, abbiamo let lateral bending, we have lateral bending, flex extension, and rotation. Okay. In the report, the protocol provides kinematic data here. Let's zoom a little bit. Okay. And in particular, it uh, points out not only the range of motion on the specific plane, because uh, look, uh, here we are in the page dedicated to the lateral bending movement. In fact, we have the green line that identifies the movement on that plane. So this is the real components on the frontal plane. But it's very useful, it's very important to assess also the movement at the same time, of course, the movement on the other planes. Okay, in order to evaluate if there is some possible angular compensation on another plane on which there should not be any movement contribution. Okay. About the muscle work in the next. Page. Okay, so this is the page for the flex extension. This is the page related to the kinematic information uh, of rotation movement. And here we arrive uh, at the muscle work. Okay, we find the energy contribution that each, muscles, uh, um, each muscle is giving out in the different subphases of the movement. And we can assess also some symmetry indexes in order to highlight the patient capability to use right and left muscles in the same way while performing the movement. Okay.
Okay, there is uh, said so there is a question in order to um, uh, that someone ask uh, how to interpret uh, clinically the smoothness uh, in the um, angle and velocity curve in the movement of the shoulder. Okay. Uh, okay, I take in consideration this question. Uh, let me finish the presentation, and then I can I can come back to to the to the report, and I uh, can explain more in detail this uh, this parameter. Okay. Uh, finally, I would like to show something about the sport functional protocol. Okay, um, we have running and bike uh, protocol for running and cycling uh, um, evaluation. Okay, so these two protocols are very similar in terms of report. Let's start to see the report related to the run protocol. Okay, you can see that we have here in the cycle, in this case, in the cycle, that start from the foot contact, in this case of the right side, up to the next foot contact, always of the right side, okay? We have the first uh, stance, the, the stance phase, okay? The, first float phase, the stance phase of the opposite side, and the second float phase up to the closing of the cycle. And so in this case, we can evaluate the muscle strategy to perform the running movement, of course, and this gray horizontal band uh, represent the normal activation of the muscle in terms of timing of activation. So this gray band is saying to us that the tibialis anterior has to be active exactly in this part of the cycle and in this other part of the cycle. Pay attention that the velocity with which the patient, the, the subject is running is fundamental. And in the software, you uh, can find three different velocity ranges based on which is the velocity with which the, the subject is running. So you, the software provides three different normal uh, range. In the previous page, in the previous page, we have also in terms of amplitude, which is the contribution of each muscle. And like in the static posture, we have also the global, the total contribution of the right cycle, the right side, sorry, and the global contribution of the left side. You know very well that when you have a symmetric uh, motor task like uh, running, like walking, like uh, bicycle, okay, where the two sides are involved in the same way, it's very important to assess the percentage of symmetry. Uh, when you have a difference around 2% between a right and left, we can say that there is still a good symmetry. But when this difference starts to reach 3% or 4%, okay, so the, the, the difference is uh, becoming a little bit high, okay? Good. You can see immediately in the cycling uh, protocol that the uh, layout of the report is exactly the same with the uh, contribution in terms of percentage of each muscle. And also here we have the coordination uh, behavior, okay, within the cycling cycle, of course, in this case. 
for the right side and also for the left side. Also in this case, the horizontal band identify the correct timing of activation, but it's important that uh, the subject is performing this test, maintaining 80, 90, up to 100 RPM, so revolution per minute. So it's very important, which is the velocity with which uh, the subject is cycling. The drop fall is a very important protocol in order to prevent injury on the uh, anterior crusate ligament. Okay, in this case, like you can deduce from the picture, so the subject starts from a, a platform 30, 40 centimeters of high, okay, and then the subject has to be fall down in order to arrive to strike the, uh, the ground with only one foot, okay, and the protocol allows to uh, quantify the pre-activation timing. So in this table, we go to assess how millisecond before the striking, the muscle is on. You can understand very well that before striking the ground, it's necessary to have a pre-activation of our muscles in order to um, establish the joint, the knee joint. So when we go to have the impact with the ground, it's necessary to have a co-contraction of anterior and posterior muscles of the knee in order to accept and prevent injuries because of the strike the, with, with the ground. And finally, this is uh, the, um, the protocol dedicated for the muscular, uh, muscle, um, neuromuscular balance evaluation of uh, anterior temporalis and masseter muscles in order to evaluate which is the balance at this level, okay, thanks to these uh, mass, uh, muscles involved uh, in, in the, in, during also the, the, the performance in order to maintain a good balance, okay? And so also mainly in the sport field, when we go to, to use uh, a bite, it's very important to evaluate uh, if the, um, the bite is, uh, helping or not helping the, the, the subject, okay? Because uh, I repeat, the, thanks to this protocol dedicated to the temporal mandibular joint, we can analyze the neuromuscular balance of these masticatory muscles that are responsible of the dental occlusion, okay? The test is very fast because uh, it takes only five seconds, okay? And the patient is asked to make a maximum isometric clenching, firstly on some cotton rolls and then on teeth. And it's immediately possible to understand by some of these uh, synthetic indexes if the muscles are in balance and if therefore the patient has a correct occlusion barycenter by using or not using, for example, a bite during the performance. Okay, mm, now, at the end of my presentation, let me stress again the importance and the great advantages that can be obtained by using the functional protocol. So the benefits are for the, clinic, the clinician as well as the patient. It's clear 
the advantage of having quantitative and objective information that helps the clinician to better understand the patient's motor behavior. At the same time, the use of this technological solution allows the clinician to make explicit the need of treatment. And all that leads the patient to become also loyal to the clinician. Of course, even the patient can take advantages. The technology allows the patient to move in total freedom with maximum comfort. The tests are very fast and the contents of the reports are very easy to read, even for the patient who can therefore find uh, satisfaction and motivation to perform the test. Okay, I have finished. <laughs> Thank you very much for your attention. Uh, I took uh, 45 minutes and now I can start to answer to your question. So I start immediately for uh, the first- Hi, Diana. Hi, Hi, Diana. Hi, it's Martina. Hi. Hi. Hi, everybody. Uh, there are uh, two questions for you. Uh, yes. The first one is from uh, Stephanie, and she asking uh, if uh, our functional protocols can be used on children and how young. Oh, yes, of course. Uh, yes, there is not uh, any limit of age. So the protocols uh, can be used uh, uh, absolutely on uh, elderly, adults, patients, and also on uh, uh, young, uh, young patients uh, in the pediatric, pediatric uh, application. So in my experience, I use this protocol on uh, children uh, four, five uh, years old. So there is no any limit uh, of age uh, in using uh, the functional and, of course, uh, these uh, technologies on the patient. Okay, thank you. And then Elena asks, how is performed MG signal normalization? Yes, okay, uh, of course. So, uh, first of all, uh, when we want to compare some data uh, be among patients, different patients, or uh, uh, between the same patient in different uh, uh, moments, in different time, it's necessary to have uh, a normalized data. We can have uh, two different types of normalization. We can normalize the EMG data in terms of time or in terms of amplitude. Okay, so when we go to assess the timing of activation, so when we want to answer to the clinical question, when the muscle is active, we have to normalize the, in the time. And so when we go to uh, define the muscle activity within the gait cycle or the uh, movement cycle, okay, for any motor task, we are performing the time normalization. And so we can compare data. When we want to answer to the clinical question, how much the muscle is working, this is a, a, an answer uh, that we, um, we, can, we can find the answer in the amplitude assessment of the EMG activity. And so in this case, we have to normalize the amplitude because it's not possible to compare in the EMG data in terms of absolute value in millivolt or microvolt. So in mainly in the sport field, exactly like I showed, in the running protocol or in the bicycle protocol, there, when we go to assess the muscle contribution in terms of percentage, we are taking in consideration normalized value in the amplitude. 
Okay. Okay, Diana, thank you very much. You are okay. great as always. I think mm -hmm. that the webinar is going to end now. Uh, sorry, Martina, I <laughs> promised that uh, I answer to the first question that you wrote to me yeah. related to the smoothness. Uh, okay, yeah. let me go back on the... I write you ah, okay, okay. Yeah. Okay. Okay. So the smoothness, it's a, a sort of a computation of the acceleration. So I don't know if I have, I can use some uh, mathematical information to give you. Okay, but uh, you you know that the velocity is the derivative of the distance. The acceleration is the derivative of the velocity. And so we can uh, calculate also the derivative of the acceleration. This is the jerk of the, of the signal that it's a, a sort of computation that can give us an idea about the smoothness of the uh, movement. This index decreases with the increase of the smoothness. So lower is the index, index and higher is the smoothness of your movement. Okay? And it's very important also to evaluate this graph where we go to compare the angular velocity with the angle because it's important to evaluate the shape of this uh, sort of ring, but also to evaluate if cycle by cycle, the patient is able to have the same uh, correspondence between angular velocity and angle. Okay, Martina. I, if there is no any other question, I think that we can uh, close the webinar. Yeah, it's okay. I would yeah. like uh, to, to show again uh, our uh, contact if someone uh, has the necessity to ask us uh, some more information. Okay, please don't hesitate to, to contact us. This is the email address that you can use. And so um, I would like to thank you again for your attention. And uh, I hope to, to see you again on uh, next uh, appointments that uh, you will receive uh, from uh, the marketing department. Okay. Okay. Ciao. Martina. Bye bye. Bye bye. bye, bye. bye. Thank you. Ciao. Thank you. Ciao.